Okay, so welcome to my presentation about hardware CTF challenges, uh, about the whole journey from the idea of the challenge to the final flag. Who am I? My name is Hannes Weissteiner. This is my Twitter handle. I don't tweet ever, so follow me if you want to. You probably won't see anything from me. Um, I am an information and computer engineering student. I am also an employee at EIK at Theo Graz, which is the security institute at Theo Graz. And I'm interested in the low level, so operating systems, embedded systems, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm, I am also an active CTF player at Las Fases, which is the CTF team of the Theo Graz. In this presentation, I'm going to talk. Of, I'm, I'm going to give you some background on how to CTF challenges. I'm going to give you the motivation uh, that led me to create a hardware CTF challenge. Um, the, the whole planning that was required so it could happen. Uh, I'm going to talk about what went into designing the hardware and the software. And in the end, I'm going to show you the result and some final takeaways that I got doing that whole process. So as a quick background, what is a CTF? Um, if you don't know that, why, what are you doing here? Um, <laughs> but if you really don't know, it's a security competition uh, where you usually exploit security flaws or reverse engineer stuff um, with the goal to get a flag, which is basically a text string saying some funny words um, for imaginary internet points. And with those imaginary internet points, you can now feel cool on the leaderboard. Um, it's very fun. Um, CTF badges are very common at bigger CTFs, especially on-site. Um, for example, these badges uh, are from DEF CON. As you can see, they have some batteries, some buttons, they do something. It's, it's custom designed hardware, custom designed PCBs, and they can get very interesting sometimes if people put effort into them. Um, these are ones from NSEC, which is some conference somewhere in I think Sweden or Norway, um, which also they have a screen and some buttons. Um, why are hardware challenges important? So hardware is an important part of security. Usually if you have control over the hardware, it's very, very hard to still be prevented from accessing any data that you have. You can encrypt the data, but if the, da if, if the data is decrypted and running on the device and you have real access, you can still dump some of it most of the time. Um, hardware challenges are somewhat rare at CTFs. Um, usually, like not many people specialize in this kind of challenge. And so many times they are pretty easy compared to the rest of the challenges at the CTF, just because Many people say like, okay, it's hardware. I don't know anything about it. I'm not looking at it. Um, another problem is that real hardware challenge are only possible at on-site events. Because of course you can't ship any like custom PCB to every team that's playing. If there are 500 teams playing a CTF all over the world, it's just not feasible to do that. So I'm gonna give you a few examples of hardware challenges that I've personally played and solved. Uh, in the last year. The first example is a flick, was called Flickr. Um, there was a light, there was a room where the light was blinking. This was an on-site CTF. So there was a room with a flickering light. And you got the breadboard, you got an Arduino, you got the photo sensor and some resistors. And you had to actually build the circuit and measure the flickering light and by, by measuring it, you could differentiate like pulse lengths, and in those pulse lengths of the light flickering, uh, the flag was encoded. Um, yeah, as I said, you had to build the hardware, you had to write the software, you had to extract the flag. Um, it was a really cool challenge. Um, the second example is this badge from the Hackfu event uh, in Austria last May, I think. Um, this had many uses. It first had, uh, was used to hand in flags. If you had a flag, you had to place your badge on a special device 
then you could send that device uh, the flag and it would automatically count those points to your team. Also, it was used to track health information because the, that specific event was held in a nuclear power plant and it, it, it wasn't the operating nuclear power plant, so there wasn't any real danger of radiation. But the whole game was that if you stood in the uh, reactor chamber, the, the badge would start beeping and would start saying, yeah, it's high radiation here, so would, you would take damage. You could see that here. Uh, here, I just turned it on yesterday, so it's um, not showing anything because, of course, like all the other hardware is missing. But you could see yourself like get infected with radiation on this image, which was, re which was really fun. And the most important thing for the organizers was it was used to uh, track people in the nuclear power plant because usually you can't go in there alone. You always have to have a tour guide with you. But they managed to convince the uh, owners of it that with those badges, they can see where we are and then we can go in alone and explore the power plant which was really, really cool. Also, there were some flags in there that you could find via reverse engineering. Then, there was just a few weeks ago at Insomniac, um, we had a TOTP challenge. Um, you had to reverse engineer a TOTP, which is a time-based OTP. So the thing, the, the, the number code that you put in from your Google Authenticator to a website is a TOTP. And you had to extract the Mac, like the secret code of it, to copy it, essentially. And then you had to walk over physically to the desk where the device was laying and put in the code via gyro sensor, so by tilting it. Um, and you had to read the flag before somebody else read it over your shoulder. Also, another challenge from this exact CTF, you had to reverse engineer keypad measurements, like really real electronics measurements, um, and match them with the data sheet. You had to mess around with an RFID tag to get admin access. You had to scan the networks. You had to do web exploits. And I feel like this was the closest thing that I ever saw at the CTF to a like, real-world exploit, breaking into a place via like, OSINT, finding data sheets, measuring stuff, and then when you are in the network, exploiting it. So how did I get to create a hardware challenge. Well, last Tuesday there was the kind of CTF, which is a small local on-site CTF for a student high school, uh, the high school at kind of. Um, this high school specializes in, information, uh, in informatics and information security, so it was a perfect place to host a small CTF to get them interested. The CTF was organized by Los Fazis and it had seven teams of six high schoolers of uh, the fourth and fifth grade competing in the bracket for the senior students um, where they got the hardware challenge. And of course, this was the perfect opportunity to try something out. And the goal was to get those people also interested in low level security. Because, I mean, there's a lot of web exploits and like binary exploitation at CTFs, but not much hardware. And I wanted to change that. So now, how, how did I plan this? What did I do? So first, I had to set some requirements. What, what did I want to do? The batch shouldn't be too complex at first. I wanted to be able to create it, even though I don't know anything about hardware design. And also, the challenge shouldn't be too complicated so high schoolers can solve it. It should be relatively cheap. We don't want to spend like thousands of euros on a badge for a few high school students. It should be easy to repurpose because, I mean, if they throw it in, a, in, in some uh, cupboard after the CTF and never touch it again, it's kind of a waste. And for the same reason, it should be in a feature-rich ecosystem. So the easier it is to, re to reprogram this badge, and the easier it is to implement something cool on it, um, the more likely it is to get reused. It's also, I also wanted it to be cool looking, of course. And I wanted the small parts to be placed by the manufacturer because I'm really not that great at soldering. 
So soldering small SMD components, I didn't want to do that for 10, 15 badges. So I made a few decisions. I wanted to create a numpad. Um, I wanted to base the whole badge on the ESP32 because it's, it, it has many features. It has Wi-Fi, it has Bluetooth, it has an OLED screen, it has serial interfaces, it, has, it, it can do a lot, and it's really easy to program. And because we are creating a keypad already, cherry switches it is, uh, the cloned ones, because the real ones are too expensive. So now I need to actually create that hardware. Where do I start? Well, I've never created a PCB before. Um, my roommate did, so I asked him, hey, can you help me? And he was like, you'll figure it out. Um, yes, so I guess I figure it out somehow. Um, I think I need some software to do that. So as a, the professional that I am, I consulted professional tools and I clicked the professional link and this was the first thing that popped up. So I guess I'm using KiCad. Um, yeah, it was the first one in the list. It was in the Arch Linux community repository. So uh, <laughs> must be good. Apparently it works, I don't know. Literally no other factors. It was the first one that I found. Um, yeah. How do you design a circuit like this? Well, I have in, in my information and computer engineering uh, studies, I have had some electronics classes. So it was pretty straightforward. I just wanted cr to create a numpad. So just place the ESP somewhere on the PCB, place the switches somewhere on the PCB, place some pull down resistors, because otherwise the voltage is going, it's doing something. And just now I just have to figure out the pinout of the ESP which should be easy, right? Well, this, as you can see, is the, maybe you can read it, the DIY more ESP32 Wi-Fi whatever thing. Um, there's a whole family of ESPs. They are, are different, have different kinds of features. This one has an OLED screen, which, which is why we bought them. Uh, also, they were cheap. They were like, I think, eight euros per unit. Um, yeah, there was no data sheet on the website. There was no data sheet anywhere. But it kind of looks the same as this one. So somebody made a schematic for that other one. So hopefully it works anyways. Like this is the comparison. The, on the left we have what I had. And this is the health tech one. So like here are those, whatever th those things are, those resistors and, and Capacitors, they look kind of the same. Let's just hope it works. So this is the schematic I made. Pretty easy, like we have the controller here, we have the key switches here, and some pull-down resistors, so the voltage is zero, so on ground, if the switch is not pressed. Easy. So now we get to routing the PCB, because this is just a schematic. This is what you do in like uh, electrical engineering classes. Now, to get to routing the PCB, this is not done automatically. Um, so I was like, shit, I have no idea how to do that. Um, but it's actually very straightforward. You point your mouse to one point of the connection, you press X, you draw a line to the other point, done. It, it's like paint, it's connecting the dots. And then you pay attention so it looks kind of nice, but it actually doesn't really matter. Um, it also tells you very uh, obviously when a connection is still missing. So this is how it looks like. Here I have focused this point, pressed X, and now it shows me, okay, I have to connect this point, this point, this point, and this is the line that I'm drawing currently. This is done over my finished design, so th these lines are already there. But um, yeah, this is how it looks like. Just connect the dots. Now in KiCad, there are a lot of fun features. You can play with the PCB colors and materials. You can have a 3D viewer. You can have a 3D viewer with ray tracing. And then my laptop died. 
Um, you can also have a custom logo in a sorter mask, which is this one. This is exposed copper um, with the logo of the CTF. Um, took me like almost the same time as designing the rest of the PCB to get this working, but with a lot of Google, I managed to do it. Um, now, I needed to choose a PCB manufacturer. So I, again, consulted my professional tool, Google, and found those two. Um, yeah, PCB way, um, I know this one from YouTube. Like, some creators that I watch use this. It has many options. Like, look at all this stuff. You can choose all of these options. Really cool. Then there's JLC PCB. I also know this one from YouTube. And there are less options. You see, like, a few less options. So it was JLC PCB because less options means less opportunity to fuck up. Um, <laughs> it also offered free assembly for new customers, which was great. Um, it seemed pretty easy to use. They were always like, yeah, just upload the file and everything just works. Um, so yeah, let's do that. For preparing the files, uh, for the PCB it was quite easy. You run the checks in KiCad, it does automatically when exporting. It says like, okay, you have a missing connection here. This part is not the same as in the schematic as in the uh, PCB layout. Fix those and then just press export. Export the files, zip them, done. Easy. Looks like this. There's a lot of checkboxes. I don't know what they do. I just press next. It worked. Anyway. Um, for the assembly, because I wanted them to solder those pull-down resistors, uh, so I didn't have to. So I had to prepare those files, which was a bit weird. So you have to export the bill of materials, you have to export the placement files, you have to adapt it to their file format. Their file format was Excel. Um, so yeah, I just copy-pasted the values into their Excel files. You can see here. I want the 10K resistors for R1, R2 to R0 with this footprint. I don't know what this footprint is. It was the first one that popped up when I chose resistors in KiCad. Uh, I don't really care. It just has to work. This is where I specify how to place the resistors. Um, yeah, I just copy pasted those values from whatever KiCad gave me. Um, yeah, should work, right? Uh, well, some Chinese guy fixes my mistakes. Um, so this was, on the left you see the PCB uh, rendering of what I sent in. As you can see, the resistors are down here. Um, yeah, they should be up there. Um, on the right, uh, it's what their manual review gave me. So <laughs> some, some Chinese guy was looking at it like this. <laughs> Like, what the fuck is this guy doing? And fixed my mistakes for me. Great. Like, really good customer service. So now, on the website, I had to make many choices still, even though I chose the one with less choices. PCB material. I don't know. The default one, I guess. I wanted the solder mask color in black, so the PCB looks black from the outside. The silk screen color in white, so you can see it well on black. Makes sense, right? Copper surface finish? Yeah, of course I'll choose gold. I'm not paying for it. <laughs> um, yeah, then I got this nice message. You have chosen very uncommon options. It will be more expensive. So basically what I found out is if you choose like the common option, like a green PCB, all the default settings, they just have like a one square meter piece of PCB that they throw into the machine and they make like tens of different PCBs at the same time of different customers. But if you choose something uncommon, they have to start a production run just for you. So it's more expensive. Um, I don't care. I'm not paying for it. <laughs> um, many options. I don't know about these options. I just hit next. Um, yeah. The next day I got this email. Um, yeah, if it has no edge rail, we will add a five millimeter rail. Since you are a loyal client, I just ordered, uh, I, I just ordered uh, with their service for the first time, but I guess. Um, we do it for free, but next time, please choose this other option because you fucked up. 
So this guy saved me again. Thank you. <laughs> so the results. Um, yeah, I don't have many photos. I, for some reason, I didn't take many pictures. Um, this is how the solder mask um, image turned out. Um, if you want to look at it in person, I have one of them here. So if you walk up to me later after the talk, I can show you. But this looks really good. Like those fine lines are really, really thin. Looks really great. This is a picture after I soldered on the switches. This uh, engineering sample is with the good, proper cherry switches. The, the, the students got uh, cheap Kyle switches. Um, yeah, I keep this one. Um, and this is with the ESP, with some keycaps that I found while programming it. So now you might ask, how much did this cost? Um, yeah, all in all, this is the bill, like 30 euros in shipping, 20 euros in customs. It costs like 70 euros for 15 PCBs to actually manufacture them. If you choose the cheap shipping option, it arrives in like three months, but if you don't care about that, it's way cheaper. Like you get PCBs for really, really cheap if you choose the cheap options instead of doing what I did. So yes, still 115 euros for express shipping and everything is kind of fine, I think. Um, yeah. So we, now we have the hardware done. Let's talk about the software. Um, I'm not talking about, uh, about that too much because it's just software. You just write it. It's, yeah, whatever. Um, what was the goal of the challenge of the software? I wanted to show off the, uh, most of the features of the ESP. I didn't want to make it a reverse engineering challenge. I didn't want them to just look at this assembly code for like four hours and then get the flag. That's boring. I want to make people get up from the chairs and I want to give them an introduction to how you approach real hardware challenges. So what I came up with with the challenge was uh, four stages um, and each of them used another feature of the ESP. So for the first stage, you connect via serial and it prints a text. It says like, hey, you're the special agent, please help me, whatever. It's a high school CTF. I came up with the story at 2 a.m. I don't remember. Um, and it got your code. Then with this code, you got to the second stage. You connect via Bluetooth. You can use a Bluetooth terminal um, to play a game on the OLED screen. Basically, you had to move like the dot to the circle by, uh, by using WASD commands to move it around. Um, then you got the next code. For the next part of the challenge, you had to measure interference. So you had to walk around until the ESP saw the right Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, so people get up for, from their chairs. They had to run around the school, which was fun. And then when you did that, it enabled a Wi-Fi hotspot. You could connect to the hotspot and you could just do a get request or just with the browser go to the IP of the badge and you could, would get the image with the flag. Um, yeah, the transitions between stages were an eight digit pin uh, that you'd put in via the keypad and I randomized the pins to avoid flag sharing and so if you accidentally leaked something like it wouldn't help the other teams. There were a few issues with this challenge that I didn't expect. Or a, a few issues before I uh, even started it, uh, if, before I even released it. I did want to avoid unintended solutions. So all the data for the flags is on the badge. How can I hide this? Well, I just threw random bytes in between the real bytes. So it looks like a bunch of garbage. And if you took like every third byte, um, yeah, you get the real data. Also, I just saved the hash of pins and Wi-Fi's so you couldn't extract it from the binary. And basically the, the, the idea was, I was just hoping that the intended solution was easier than reversing it. It's definitely possible to reverse it still, but probably it's harder to do than just to solve the challenge. Also, I wanted to avoid reverse engineering which was pretty easy because IDA doesn't support the ESP32. Ghidra's plugin exists, but yes, um, it 
just looks like total garbage. Um, and I hope the intended solution was easier. Platform I also uh, made for some fun times because I had a script that compiled um, the team specific data onto the batch. And if I enabled it, it would wait on standard in so I could type the team name. So when handing out the batch, the team would come up to me, would tell me their name, I would type it, and it would compile. That was the idea. But Platform.io runs that script when importing metadata. So when importing metadata, it waits for standard in. So it never finishes. And it scans metadata every time you change the config file, for example, to disable the script or enable it again. <sighs> yeah, so I just commented out the input, let it scan for metadata, and added the input again. And when changing the script, it doesn't import the metadata again. So yeah, guess it works. I just can't restart uh, VS Code. The no another issue that I really didn't expect was that Wi-Fi.h is huge. Um, when including it, the binary got to 1.5 megabytes after compiling with size optimizations and stripping everything. It, it was just 1.5 megabytes. And Luckily, the, is, the ESP has four megabytes of memory, and if you, if you use the huge app partition table, it can also use that for just the binary. So the flashing tool just takes forever, but yeah, it works. And the last issue I had was the CTF was three months away when I started this, and it was two months away. One month away in two weeks. Next Tuesday, fuck. Yeah, lost a weekend to finish this batch, but it worked out in the end. So the result was it was a beautiful PCB. Uh, the logo came out great. Our soldering was kind of bad. The switches are on a bit crooked. Um, yeah, whatever, nothing I can do. Blue switches are awesome. Soldering blue switches are, is not awesome. Um, at the CTF, it was interesting for most teams. Most teams looked at it for a while, at least. It was solved by three out of seven teams, which is a good number, in my opinion. Um, I got an unexpected difficulty, which was tooling, um, because the wrong serial baud rates led to issues, because you got just garbage as data. Some Bluetooth terminals just did something wrong. Uh, Wi-Fi hotspots scanned way too slow, and but yeah. So so if you w just walked past the Wi-Fi hotspot, it would often happen that because the t the scan took like four seconds, if you walked by, by it too fast, it would just miss it, which was inconvenient. But in the end, we got good feedback by the participants, and they were very happy to that they could keep them and do something with the badges. So great success. Um, now, for the last part, a few takeaways about the hardware. Um, it was not as difficult as I expected. Um, it was a very analog process because I had like to copy paste data into an Excel sheet and then some guy in China had to look at it and actually see that I made mistakes and fix them. Um, but it was not a bad experience. Um, it wasn't as expensive as I expected especially considering I basically took the most expensive options for everything. Um, the tooling for this stuff is okay if you know what you're doing. So after reading a bit into KiCad, it's not hard to use. And it's really not that hard to get into. Google helps you a lot. And I should have done more with the assembly service. They I could have let them just place some Kyle switches. They have them on stock. I could have just made them place them so they wouldn't be crooked. Um, with the software, yeah, embedded software is weird sometimes. For example, the serial input function, which is supposed to wait until like um, there is some serial input, just returns if you do something on a second core for some reason. I don't know. Um, I had to work around that. Um, if you use many features of the hardware, you use a lot of memory. The Wi-Fi thing was really surprising, but I mean, I guess it's probably a lot of software. It's not as straightforward as desktop software. You have to think about it a bit more. I had to basically implement a state machine that would loop over every time. So like all the background features still work because I don't have threads on a microcontroller. 
And Platform IO still has its quirks sometimes. So sometimes it just does unexpected things. But yeah, you just have to deal with it. For the next challenge, I want to use more features of the ESP, definitely. I, I don't want to just showcase it uh, with such basic use cases. I wanted to implement a tracking server for this uh, challenge where you could see like how far every team has got. But um, I mean, I finished the batch like two days before the CTF, so I didn't have time for it. Next time I want to do that. Um, I could use both cores properly for more parallelism. Right now the second core is just doing some minor stuff that basically could be turned off without any issues. I want to use a more complex circuit next time um, with maybe some switches, toggles, analog parts, I don't know. Uh, maybe different architectures, multiple chips on the PCB that communicate with each other. Maybe I can create some small system on a chip on a single PCB. That would be cool. Um, but I have to adapt the difficulty on the, uh, to the audience. So I probably can't do that in a high school CTF. But maybe we can have Glacier CTF on-site finals someday. Not this year probably, but maybe someday. And yeah, that's it for my talk. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>